Okay, today I think we'll go through some of the build or build notes or whatever information I can give you to make it easy to build this dual action robot type one. And I think let's start by closing this. I have pictures taken from all three robots that I built and some of the pictures will show different things than others. If we start with the earliest ones, I think we might see some changes in this frame. Um, let's go right to Design Spark Mechanical is the th 3D CAD program that I like to use when I design all my things. <clears throat> so this is your main, I call it the motor gearbox, but it's the bottom of the robot basically. And just in case some of the pictures that I show you don't show all of the features, I thought I'd do this individually. This longest part is the back. There's going to be a clicker that goes in here and a battery box that goes here. And the motor is going to drop down in here. But around in the front, <clears throat> there's a channel area. And there are small openings that uh, come up here and here. And that's where we're going to stick in some brass wipers to provide power for spinning lights that I put up here. And this opening which drops all the way down to here is a good way to solder the wires to the motor and run them straight down because I do all the wiring down here on the bottom so I thought I would just show you that in CAD form in case some of the other uh, images that we look at don't show that uh, let's go to this is an opening picture so here's the bottom this is a standard TT type gear motor, which you can find on eBay, AliExpress, Banggood, all, all those websites. Uh, obviously your cheapest price is going to be when you order it from the sites that come from overseas, but then you're going to wait six to eight weeks to get the, the motor, whereas on a lot of the ones on eBay you can pay more money and find uh, someone reselling them you know, as a markup, but at least you can get them quicker. It doesn't matter if you use the one that's the single axle or the dual axle because I laid this out so you could drop either one in there. It's going to work best with the faster motor, which is the easiest one to get. That would be the 48 to 1 gear ratio. It, um, it would kick the gear over better in the switching. And maybe we should just start with that. Let me open up... Um, Let's go to this. I have this video up on YouTube, 3D print a single motor dual gearbox drive. And this is basically that part without the base of the robot with the motor dropped in. And if you watch this video, it's going to explain how one motor, and by reversing it, in this case I'm just using a dollar store remote control with two buttons. You push one button, the motor runs in one direction, push the other, it runs in the other. How that's able to flip this drive gear from one side to the other. So I decided to use this side as my walking cam and this side to run the doors and the head that open and the gun coming out and all that and the rotating lights. So you should watch this video. I'll put a link to it in the description of what we're looking at now. Let's go back to our pictures. So I hold the motors in here in America with a screw that's very common. It's called a 632. Number six is the basically the diameter, and the 32 are the number of threads per inch. And it's very common, these two little ones, for example, are left over from an AC light switch or wall socket switch, the ones that hold them on. If you ever throw those out, I've ever replaced one. You should hang out of the screws, they're very useful. Anyway, they're short and they're 632. And when I drop the motor in, because we're, we're looking at the robot's right side now. If this motor went in, you'd want the drive shaft go for the gear going to, to the left. And I'm going to put two screws in here. I'm going to put a short one in here. Then I'm going to put a longer one in here, even though it shows too short. I'm going to put one in that's uh, maybe use a 5 8 inch long one or 3 quarter and screw it in so it's sticking out some because that'll become a stop that you'll see here in a little bit. Let's see what picture comes up next. Okay, so here's the, the motor in. This again was an early design. This would be the all red one. And I was going to do a separate clicker. That's why this gear is kind of cut away. 
so that when the guns came out there was a mechanical clicker just for the guns. Forget about that. It went on a, in a different direction. But it does show the motor placement sitting in there. So now we're getting to the side, the business side of it, the side we care about. And basically you've got this swing arm, you've got this main gear, which has the cutout double D that will slide onto the shaft. So first you put this around that, slide this gear through that hole all the way into the motor. And then to keep it in place, I do like to take a, a, a number two screw, uh, self-tapping, fairly long. Uh, I didn't measure it, probably three-eighths or something, because you want to make sure you can get through the gear and screw into the end of the shaft. You don't want this little gear ever coming off is all I'm getting at. And then this gear fits onto this post, under the swing arm. And then there's a cap. And originally I was using a little spring to add a little bit of drag to this to make sure that, depending on the rotation of the motor, it would kick this gear to the left or the right. Totally not needed. Don't worry about the spring. In fact, if you get a spring with a sharp end and it starts digging in the PLA, it'll just cause you more problems. We don't need the spring. We still need the cap just to keep the gear from falling off the swing arm. So when I uh, drop the, the gear on, I put the cap on, I go ahead and screw it down until it's tight, and then I back it off about a full turn so that the cap is not binding. It's just holding the gear from falling off. So here's what that looks like when it's assembled. Again, this would be the front. The longest part back here is the rear, because this is where the battery box is going to sit. Then there's this clicker, and there's two places to keep it aligned. And you're going to want to uh, glue the clicker in place so that it can't go anywhere. This part that sticks back is when the clicker gets pulled, it gets pulled in this direction. And when it uh, slides past this thing, then it flies back. When it flies back, this is going to hit the back side of the body to make the resonant thud. So thump, thump, thump. So you're going to want to glue it in that way. And I think I have a lot of pictures. Let's go up to the internet one here. So might as well talk about glues because there's going to be some gluing in this project. This is a, a YouTube video I have up there on the best PLA glue that you can find for the money, but just in general, I'll, I'll give you the lowdown. The 3D gloop that you can buy is very expensive. This little tube with shipping was about $15, but it is the best glue. Nothing comes close. It actually melts the PLA parts together. It's not a surface bonding glue. Your regular super glues, your CA glues, they are just a surface glue, meaning that the glue doesn't melt anything. It's just trying to bite into the imperfections of the two surfaces. And then when the glue itself turns solid, it's hoping everything will stay there. You can al almost always snap a super glue or a CA glue joint apart, which sometimes is a benefit. Because if you're working on something and you're not 100% sure that it's finalized, you might want to use CA just so that you can get in there with a little knife or something and, and hit it and break it apart and make your change. The next best one to use is this uh, acrylic, uh, what was it? Anyway, this great big huge tube was again only $15 and that was with shipping or $17. It's the Weld On number 16 and it actually melts the PLA as, as well. So you get a true bond between the two parts. The solvents in here aren't quite as concentrated as in here. This melts the PLAs better. This does melt them. It is possible at some sometimes to break this apart if you're going at it with a razor blade and a hammer or something if you had to and uh, get it apart. And just by the by, I don't have a, a good looking tube here. All I have is this old beat up tube. But uh, if you're gluing dissimilar things, this E6000, which is actually the same thing as, now don't confuse these words, with 3D gloop, 3D, just regular goop, G-O-O-P, that you can find in any big box star, uh, store and sold under different things like goop automotive, goop marine, goop uh, plumbing, even shoe goop. They're all the same thing. This E6000 is the same thing. It's goop also, just under a different name. This is the name they normally sell in the hobby store so they can charge more. The other ones, they put all those different names on the stuff 
because that'll put it in different departments in the store, which gets their product on more shelves, which gives them more coverage, and they'll sell more. Anyway, this is the best stuff for gluing dissimilar things together, like if you wanted to glue glass to metal, or PLA to steel, or, or anything like that. Again, it's just a surface bonding type glue, but because it's um, rubbery, it's a, a synthetic new type rubber, which is paintable and everything, because it's not solid like your CAs are, it won't, the parts won't tend to come apart because there's give. You can bend, you can flex, they're going to want to stay together. But if you ever really had to get them apart, you could get in there with a knife and cut them and, and rub the glue off and, and fix them. Anyway, we've touched on the glue. Let's get that out of here. Let's get back to our pictures, which I think we were down here. Okay. So we've glued our clicker in. This is the battery box, and it has a cutout. The cutout goes in the bottom to fit around these ridges. When it comes to finding these little terminals, I did find these on eBay. I just put in battery box connectors, battery box terminals, kept searching till I found different ones. And the main problem I have, why I'm not going to give you a link for that, is one, the sellers that I use for these aren't up there right now anymore. I mean, you know, it's an eBay auction. They, they change, they come, they go. But I have tried ordering in the past two or three times. I never get the same thing twice. So I can't really give you a description of that. But it's, these are not super critical. You can go to the dollar store and you can buy dollar store flashlights or dollar store toys or something and tear them apart just to get these connectors out. If you just make sure whatever you're buying in the dollar store says it runs on AA batteries and or two AA batteries or something. Because even if this part was a little bit shorter or something, you could always glue it in place back here. If you don't have goop, you could use hot melt glue to hold it in place. And then your positive and negative one over here, just about anything you could hot melt or goop in place if you had to. So this is what it's going to look like when the clicker is in place, the battery box is glued in place, and you got your swing arm drive off the motor in place. Next what we're looking at is the parts for the, the walking, the drive. There's a main gear that has the cam built onto it. There's a separate hex axle. There's these bushings which slide on the hex axle. This big end goes towards the gear. The little end is going to go into this hole. This is your clicker piece that will go into the axle as you're sliding everything together. And it'll have a, it has a straight side in and a slope side. You're, when you install it, you're going to make sure you put it with the slope side uh, facing so that when you turn this gear from this side that we're looking at, this is the left side of the robot, when you turn it clockwise, you'll want the slope side to be pushing the clicker back. And then when it reaches the end of the slope side, it drops off right away. Then you'd put this bushing in, actually from the outside in, and then the crank on the other end. And the, um, again, the big gear and the crank get glued onto this hex axle. I normally put the drops of glue inside there or inside the walls of the gear when I push them together. You don't have to worry about uh, if some glue seeps out, it binding to this because we have these bushings here, remember? And the bushings are keyed so it doesn't matter if these kind of slop over. All these parts print flat without support. Uh, the battery box prints flat without support. The clicker prints without support. This base piece prints as you're seeing it without support. Yeah, all so far all these parts print without support. Again, when I'm printing uh, gears, I do like to run at a higher uh, ratio. Instead of just 20% infill, I may turn it up to, to 50 or something. I want to make sure the gear is nice and solid, and I want my clicker nice and solid. So... For the gears and this stuff that you're seeing here in orange, you might just want to just set your percentage at about 50% infill. Uh, I printed all my parts on a Persa MK3S, and I do use the Persa Slices system. So just go and use their PLA one, and uh, if you're looking for quality edges, use the, the point two quality setting. Or if you just want to get it done quick, just use the point two standard. So here it is assembled, 
the slope is here and the drop off there. So if this were to be turning in a clockwise motion, it'll catch that, pull the clicker back. Now these, since this whole robot design is a what what I'm calling an inverted pin walker, and for the you, those of you who don't really know what that means, um, there were very old toys that had legs, feet, legs, and bodies that didn't move. They were just solid pieces, but they were hollow because they were made out of tin. Then inside that leg thing, they would run a pin off a crank, which if it has a pivot point, gives it an elliptical movement. And as that pin would contact the ground, that would drag one side of the robot or toy forward, and then when the opposite one hits, it would drag it forward. So on this one, we're doing, instead of external legs, that, feet that don't move, we're doing an internal brace part that doesn't move, because we're going to glue these right to the bottom around those slots. And then the actual leg that's going to, we're going to assemble around it is what we're going to connect to the crank. What influenced me on this concept, and let's go back up to here, not to there, let's go to here and look for Rick 100 on YouTube. I like a lot of what Rick does. He's very good at working things out, and he did a, a smaller robot design doing this inverted pen walking action. So you might want to watch his video. And again, if I remember when I post this thing, I'll put a link to this video. But you might just want to click on the Rick 100 and look at all the things that he's designed and built. But he goes into a lot of detail about how he made his little guy walk and uh, put uh, fake leg parts on there to make it look more cosmetic appealing. And that was what gave me a lot of the uh, influence on what I was doing on this one. It's not that this hasn't been done with toys and everything. It has. It's just that I hadn't thought about doing it with 3D printed ones until I uh, saw what he was up to. So, these parts print flat like you're seeing them without supports. And here, starting to kind of look like an ostrich. But you can, get a, you can see how this is going to hold the robot upright regardless of whatever the feet are doing. Now this part gets glued in the back back here, this longer part front, obviously it's going to be flipped over when it's done, gets pushed all the way up against these black things. And I hope there's a picture here of that next. But this ends up being a support for the uh, hip covers. There we go. So here you can see the non-moving legs glued in place. And then this piece glued in place. And you can see there's little holes in here. Because as we get to assembling the legs, this gives us a place to screw the hip cover in so it can move. Here's your body back. You've got a battery door. I use, again, some number two. You can see they're fairly long. I think they're maybe half inch or three eighths. I can't remember exactly. But put, drop a couple screws in. Nothing latches the door down. It's just to hide the batteries for cosmetic reasons. Using the uh, standard slide switch that I've used in all of my uh, designs. Again, you can find these on eBay. The key thing here is between the two mounting holes, it's about 19 millimeters. Just a smidgen over, actually. It's like 19.1 or 19.2. Then you'll need a couple of small uh, number two machine threads to match that. They don't come with the switches. At least they never have for me. And here we are. The door is screwed on. The switch is screwed in. And here's showing the arm parts. Uh, the arm parts all print flat, like you're seeing, just like that. Again, no supports. And the main thing is, these parts here, I'm going to be gluing onto the back of this arm to provide a nub to go through the hole. And once that's through the hole, then these parts glue to the smaller nub from the inside. Normally, I'll, I'll put the glue inside that ridge like that and then just press everything together. If the glue did slop, you would end up with a uh, arm that's glued in place. So on the inside of the body around that hole, you could take a little bit of grease or Vaseline and just slightly go around there. That way, if a little bit of glue oozed out, it won't be able to stick to the PLA. And your arm can still be poseable. And that's what it's going to look like. This is from the back again, of course. Here we are from the front. You can see how those other ring parts get glued in. 
And as I glue them, I hold them as tight as I can so they'll stay snug, add a little friction to it. Okay, so these are the beginning of the actual legs that move, legs and feet that are going to go up to these, these cams. This is, we're looking at, this is the back of the robot, so this is the robot's left side. So this little nub is going to be facing to the inside. So this leg actually goes over on the right side. This leg is the one that's going to be going right on here to the left side. There's a hole that runs through here, through here, through here, all the way across. You're going to need a metal pin shaft to shove through there. That's your, your uh, tipping point for the arm, your pin point. And uh, I had some two millimeter metal shafts left over from some kits that I'd gotten from China or something. But you can find some metal uh, tubing at your hobby store, or you might just get a jumbo paper clip and straighten it out. I haven't tried this idea, but it probably would work. You probably could just take some of your 0.75 filament if you could uh, straighten it out and run the filament all the way through as that tipping point. So here you can see how the leg goes over that. I then, in this case, I have a metal washer on here, but now the, in the parts, there's a plastic, there's a PLA one that you print and again, hold it on with a uh, number two self-tapping screw. You can see how the metal rod pin has gone through and this gives you both feet. Um, since the legs and these covers and everything print flat uh, without any supports, basically laying in this position, with your printer you might get a little bit, you know, elephant's foot, your first bottom layer part squishes a little bit more. Well this bottom part is what's going to give you your traction of your toy and if it's got that little thin line stick in there it's going to tend to slip, very little grab on whatever surface you're trying to walk on. So you're going to want to make sure that you take on these bottom edges that are going to be contacting your walking surface, sand them or file them. In other words, get that little bit of elephant's foot off there so you can get the most amount of contact possible. And I found an even better way to add more traction is to uh, go along just this outer edge with the goop, not gloop, but goop like you buy in your box stores, and just put a thin layer on there, smooth with your finger, so just a thin layer and let it dry. Because it's so rubbery and it stays that way even after it dries, it would be like adding a rubber weather strip or rubber grip to the bottom of the feet and it makes it grip really well on slick surfaces. Okay, so in that last picture you saw those outer covers. See there's that divot from the leg part we talked about earlier. You want to make sure that the divots are facing the inside. Um, let's go back one more picture just so you can see what we're talking about. These are going to glue on, for example, this one would glue over onto this foot and you would put just glue along the raised parts and which would be just like here to here and from here up to here and just hold it in place. There, there isn't anything to align it unfortunately but I haven't found it to be a problem to glue them on and if you're using the uh, weld on number 16 or the 3D gloop um, you'll find that it bonds almost instantly. You won't have to hold it more than five or six seconds and it'll be done. So there they are glued on on both sides. So we're already starting to hide that inner part that we talked about that doesn't move with the feet that actually do move. And what you're seeing in this picture are what I call the knee covers. And you can see that there's the hole there, there's the hole in the end of the divots, there's holes in these parts, and we're going to go in with some shorter uh, actually quite short, maybe quarter inch long number two self-tapping. You don't want them too long so they bind up on anything inside the feet, but you need a little something there to act as the pivot point because these knees have to move. What we're building up now is a lot of the fake leg parts that make the whole thing look really cool, make it look more articulated than it actually is. You don't really notice just the elliptical motion of this when you get knees and, and hip parts all moving. It's kind of a good idea when you print them and the files are marked, for example, it'll say right knee parts, if you kind of mark them so you don't get confused as to what's what. But in the end, all you have to remember is that these covers have a part that sticks out. Those are always going to be to the front and they're always going to be to the outside. 
So as long as you get these in the right place, you're good to go. What I like to do is rotate the stuff to where I can reach in with a screwdriver from one side to the other. And I'll screw one of these in loosely, you know, don't want them tight because remember everything has to move. Then come around and again, you're just going to be putting glue on this edge here, this edge here, and then setting that part in place till it dries. It's non-load bearing. It's a cosmetic part. Just a simple glue to glue edge thing will be more than sufficient. And this is what it's going to look like when they're glued together. These are those covers on the outside. And like I say, the little divot part with the hole towards the front of the foot, which is your small part. Everything should be moving totally freely at this point. You should be able to rock those back and forth. Here are the hip covers and the large hole with a deep well is what's going to screw into this part that we glued on the bottom earlier. And this little divot part up front is going to screw into here. And again, you're going to, it doesn't matter if you use a long or a short screw back here. I actually use some long ones on mine. But this front one, you'll probably want to go in with a shorter screw. And again, you can just tighten everything down and then back everything off like a half turn because you want it loose so that everything can move when the toy is walking. And it should more or less look like that. And you should be able to sit up here and turn this gear clockwise by hand and, and see that the motions are all free and working. This picture is kind of showing a lot of the stuff. This is the front of the robot now. This is the part, the large gear, uh, this lift part that are going to cause the doors to open, the guns to come out. These are the rotating LEDs. There's a, a spindle part in here, which I take some uh, brass and that I got from the hobby store. It's real thin stuff. It's like paper, only it's brass. You just cut it with scissors. You cut a couple thin strips and solder them together on either side to make a commutator and a couple of even thinner strips to fit in those slots that we talked about earlier. Back in, back in here, there's really thin strips slide up through this channel in here and through this channel in here and come out the top. So let's get back to our picture. Because you have to be able to make a, if you're going to do the spinning light effect, there's no reason you have to do that. But if you want to do the spinning light effect, you got to get the, the power up to those LEDs. Then I throw in a current limiting resistor um, for those LEDs. And in this case, I'm just using a 39 ohm. You could use anything from a 39 to a 100 ohm, whatever you want. Because we're going to be running in the 3 to 5 volt range, depending on how you wire this toy up. And we'll get into that next. This LED here is wired in the opposite direction. These particular top ones, I always I wired the negative side of the LEDs to this side and the positive to this side. And this one down here, I reverse the other way around with the negative side under this end of the copper strip and the positive of this. And what that does is this is going to get the same power that we're feeding the motor. So when the motor gets voltage to go in one direction, this LED lights in the walk direction, for example. And when you reverse the power to the motor so that this gear is engaged, then this LED will go out and these LEDs will be lit as they're turning. To give you the turning effect. And I'm not sure what we got coming up next. We'll take a look. Well, it's just a view from another angle showing the, the gear drive. And this again was an early prototype. And this earlier prototype, I actually used a relay. I think that was, I can't remember if it was a 3 volt or a 5 volt relay to control the current to the motor. And this is a, a 555 timer circuit that I kludged together just to see if that would give me a way to do timing cycles between the two. Now, as you saw earlier from the internet, and let's go back to wherever the heck that is. Here? No. It must be here. Let's go to... In this earlier video, if you watched that, you can see I just used a wired remote. You can still build this robot with a wired remote, or you could put a switch on the back of it. What I decided to do when I was making this robot is to 
use a timer circuit to control the length of time that it walks and the, versus the length of time that it does shooting the gun and just keeps cycling back and forth. But you could go in there with any kind of programmable thing that you want to use. It doesn't doesn't matter. I'm not sure what I've got over here. Oh, so instead of a relay, what I ended up putting in there, and this is a a video that I have up on YouTube, and I think right here the L91 one. Oh, here we go. So here I have a video showing how to use these modules. Again, you can buy them on eBay or any of the China places. And they're, this is a dual H-bridge driver, meaning they're kind of meant to uh, run one motor here and one motor there. You could run two different motors and make them run forward and backward and everything. But in my case, I'm going to use one motor off this lower one. And then I'm going to use the upper one as an inverter. So I take a wire from this output of it bring it back to this input pin off that input pin um, on the actual robots that I just built I used a 1k resistor to ground so you have ground and V plus coming in here clip that pin off connect these two pins together and now what you have is a line that is internally pulled high so all you have to do is provide a low so the motor will run in one direction on power up and when you provide the low it'll reverse so it gives you a single line control of reversing the motor and that's what I decided to use instead of the relay. And the main reason was these are less expensive than the relays. But relays, because you're energizing a coil, uh, use power to do that. And it's going to use anything from 60 milliamps to 120 milliamps, depending on which particular low voltage relay you happen to buy. So this video, if you need to see how this works and why it works, I'll put a link to that as well. And let's get back to our pictures. So I have some newer ones showing the placement of everything, and we'll get to that in a minute. Let's just see if there's anything else useful here. So now we're getting up into the gun part. It's made of two parts. There's this tip plate, and then tip plate two, and tip plate two is the actual gun. This gets glued onto there. No big deal there. Just line the upper curves up and glue it in place. Again, you're going to need another uh, two millimeter rod or thereabouts because it goes through this hole all the way over to there. But first, you know, it goes through the tip plate. And here I have a, uh, I wanted the end of my gun to be a red LED. I'm using, uh, since it's just basically an indicator and I'm not trying to broadcast a ton of light, I put a 220 ohm resistor on there to current protect it. Uh, since it's going to be working, as you'll see here in a minute, in about the 5 volt range. So glued the LED in there with the long wire coming out, got the post through, the tip plate. This whole plate should move very freely. And I have some pictures that we'll look at in a second showing how I routed the wires. Now the front of the robot, um, because there's those LEDs in there shining out and up and rotating, this whole plastic tends to light up, and I kind of decided I wanted the light to just come through the holes on the front of the robot. So I got some regular aluminum tape. They call it duct tape, but it's uh, just aluminum tape. You can find it at your home centers. And I just crammed it on the inside, then went through with an X-Acto blade and cut the holes out again, and then took that red gel and using the goop glue like you buy in the home centers, I put some goop glue dabs in there and then just push the gel down. So it makes all the holes look dark until the uh, LEDs are on, like so. So now we're up to the, the head. You got your main head part, you got your two doors. Again, you need two small pivot rods. Again, you could use a uh, jumbo paper clips straightened out or you could use if you ended up buying a rod at the hobby store that's around two millimeters in size there's pins that are going to go from these holes up to the top and of course they're going to go through here these hoops will be up at the top to help you orient that and of course the eyes and the mouth will get glued on appropriately like so there's more pictures coming up showing you how to uh, hook that up let's Let's go back to where the images are. Okay, I think this, some of this will be stuff we've already covered, but these are new images. 
I'm trying to find ones that talk more about the slip clutch. So let's take a look starting here. And now we're getting closer to this clutch assembly. You had the large gear, there's a hex axle, there's the bushing, there's this part that slides in that we solder the LEDs to and the brass to. Then there's a plate piece which I solder a large metal washer. It's got a half inch hole on the outside. It's about one and a quarter to one and three eighths outside diameter. You want to buy the cheap ones. You don't want galvanized or stainless steel. Just the cheap stamped ones. You'll pay like 20 cents for them. And there's this piece here that has holes in it. And in one of those holes, we're just going to insert a eight by three magnet which again I found at uh, my case it was a Home Depot and there's an end cap on here and when I assemble everything again I tighten everything down then I loosen it up a full one I don't want this to be binding or adding any drag I just want it to keep things from possibly falling apart later it's just showing that I used the long screw and the cap going in here you can actually see the little magnet I just picked one of the four holes that I provided it doesn't matter which hole we use Here's the actual arm piece. This would be facing up actually. Should have, should have taken the picture with it flipped around. But here you can see the magnet sitting in the hole. And the magnet's just going to want to stick to this metal washer, which I've used goop glue to glue to the black pressure plate back here. And the pressure plate is being driven by this gear. It'll constantly be turning, just like the lights. And this magnet adds drag to that so the it'll when it, this arm is facing up, it comes up and hits that swing plate, pushes the guns and the mouth and everything open, and yet won't bind up the motor because the magnet will then start slipping on the metal washer. Here are the actual magnets. You can find them online. There's no problem. It's just that I was in the Home Depot and they had the, they had the washer and they had the magnets, so I just went ahead and got everything there at the same place. Again, they, they call it out as, uh, if you go in inches, what it says, 0 0.315 by an eighth or something. But down here, it says 8 millimeter by 3 millimeter. And that's the size. Okay, these are some build pictures that I took um, after that first prototype one you saw. And I took them in this order because it's easier for the camera to show stuff when the clicker and the battery box are not in place. So again, this is the back of the robot, and normally the battery box would be sitting here and the clicker would be glued in there. This is a five volt booster inverter regulator. You'll find them on eBay, you'll find them on Ollie and Banggood and all those places fairly inexpensively, under a buck, in fact, if, from the channel ones if you're willing to wait six to eight weeks for them to come. Here's that driver that we talked about. I end up just gluing it to the back of the motor mount. This gets glued in right about there. Here it is with the clicker in place. See how it's getting harder to take pictures with a camera. It's kind of why I did it, this one in this order. There's a little sharper picture. It's easier to see what's going on. But uh, take the output of it, the 5 volt regulated output and go into the uh, dual H drive board. And this side here, you're gonna, I'm going to run one of the wires through the switch, but right into the battery, you're feeding at 3 volts, and this is going to boost it up to 5 at a regulated. So now the battery box is glued in place, and the click, you can see, it would have been pretty much impossible to take in the pictures earlier. Here, you can see it from this side. I took the positive in this case, and this is going to go up to the switch. And bring a wire back down to the board. I got the ground coming directly into the board. Here's those two lower ones that you saw, which I'm going to end up using as my motor drive. And what do we got next? On this side, coming off um, the dual H bridge, I need to be able to control it, and my 5 5 timer is going to sit up here. So you need ground plus 5 and your control line. So that's why there's three wires coming up here. Just another angle. This is showing the screw sticking out that we talked about earlier. That that tip arm, when it's not pushing the guns up, gives it something to rest on so it can't get down and maybe get caught in your wiring or anything. You can see this from this side. 
Now we have the uh, leg drive gears put in, the clicker mechanism put in. From the back view, this would be the opposite side. Here we have the assembly for the front and the rear. Just more views showing you how that arm can come down and rest here. When it's not engaged, it's free to drop down. You can see the magnet and the holes. Here it is with the non-moving legs. Bottom view showing how they glue around the slots. They come all the way out to the outside edge when you glue them in place. Here's another view of it. Showing this part glued in place, how it butts right up against those so you know where you're at. And then side to side it's the same width. This is where the hips are going to screw in later. So now we have the actual drive leg in there. Again, the tits are to the inside. Just another angle. The switch has been soldered in place because I wanted to test things to make sure everything was working at this point before I went too much further. In this case, <clears throat> I wanted to keep running this motor as close to 3 volts as possible, even though I'm on a 5 volt system now. So I ended up taking two diodes just regular 1 amp 4001 type diodes, one in each direction, soldered together. Because when you run through a diode, you lose about uh, 0 0.75, 0 0.78 of a volt. Let's just call it 0.8 of a volt passing through a diode. And by facing them each way, then it doesn't matter if that H bridge is telling this to run in the walk or that. I'll get the same voltage drop. The H bridge itself has a total loss of almost 0.8 of a volt also. Each one of the drivers is about 0.4, so altogether you lose about 0.8. So altogether you've lost almost you've lost more than a volt and a half. So starting at your five volts, that'll get you down to about three and a half volts, which is very close. I could just run the motor on the five; it'll run just fine on five. But at the higher the voltage, the more the current draw you're putting on things. So the more the current draw you're putting on your booster, which means more of the current draw you're putting back in your batteries. So I just went ahead and added the diodes to get everything closer back to the original three to kind of limit my current draw. Now you can see the legs passing up through. You can definitely see how these nipples or tits, whatever you want to call them, are on the insides. More views. Here we can see that the outside leg part has been glued on. I have sanded. In my case, actually, you just used the file to take all of the little elephant's foot off to give me a nice smooth bottom. So now it should look like that. Bring it up. Tip plate, you already know about that. The arms assembled. This particular one, I used a, um, a silky black for the arms. Here are the knee parts. I'm going to end up gluing this directly onto there. And of course you got the hip part screwed on to the knee part. So there are two batteries in the back. So, to make sure that the doors and the head will close, retract all the way, I was originally going to use springs, but it's so hard to find springs that I thought if anyone else wanted to build this, I better use something that's easy to find. So if you go to uh, fabric stores or bead stores, you can find elastic thread. Now black or silver thread would have been better, but white was what I was able to find, so that's what I used. As you can see, I got some uh, very small diameter. You tied a knot and I uh, super glued the knot so it won't come undone. And then in the back of the head, there's two holes you can bring it through which I then tied and glued. And basically you want the string just limp when the door is closed. And it'll tighten as the door is open. That way it isn't adding any real resistance for the guns to initially come out. But it will add a lot of resistance to help everything close back up. This is the uh, 555 timer board, which I found some on eBay. There was one eBay seller that was selling like 20 of them for $20 with free shipping or something like that. But anyway, it gives you your whole timer board and a speed control. So you bring up your ground, your plus five, and then your trigger out goes back to the H bridge to control that. 
and you've got a nice pot where you can uh, adjust your timing cycle. The only thing I had to change on this timer board is the way the ones that I bought came. They were using a 0.1 UF capacitor for the timing, which is give you very quick cycles like this. So I ended up uh, soldering in. You can use a, a 4.7 UF or all the way up to a 10 UF. 10 UF is probably better. Solder it right across or replace the 0.1 cap that they have in there and then use your your pot here to adjust the amount of timing you want it. I want it around somewhere between five and six seconds per cycle. In other words, five or six seconds of walking, five or six seconds of, of gun. So again, you can see that sitting in there. This arm should be all the way up here, but it's just sitting down in this picture. Here's another picture of the head showing where I like to glue the eyes and mouth on. And again, you've seen this before, but it's the prep on the LED that I'm going to glue in there, like so. I try to find s some small wire that's flexible, because you don't want to add a lot of bind to this thing moving. If this can't move freely, things are going to hang up. If you do want to use an electronic sound, you don't want to spend a lot of money on a sound chip or sound card or a recordable greeting card thing, then again, you can just go to the dollar store and buy one of these alarms and modify it. The batteries are here, so I just cut the case off. I don't need the batteries. I have my own supply. They have a reed relay in there, which I snip out of there. And because I didn't want it as loud, I actually threw in a diode and a 39 ohm resistor. And a 0.1 capacitor. They reduce the voltage going in because these will work at a very low voltage to make it a little bit quieter. So you can strip the whole thing apart and get rid of the stuff you don't need. This is looking up. Here's the back. You're looking up. So this would be the robot's right side. How I bring the wire and I actually uh, use some super glue to glue it to the very front edge of this tip plate when it's all the way down and how you can route it around that pin to provide a hinged joint that should offer less resistance and a lot less bending on the wires. And there you can see it from that angle and from this angle because when it comes down in the end we're just going to be soldering it in. And if you do want to use the uh, alarm squeaker thing, a good place to glue it, just go to the back of the head glue it in place back there, route the wire up to the side and kind of tack it in place with some glue kind of angling towards the front so it'll be out of the way so you can drop it in. Again I'm going through the foil thing here we already covered that and I think that may be the end of these pictures. So I don't think there's anything else here that's really going to help you with the build. I I guess if you have more questions, go ahead and post them, and I'll try my best to answer them. But I think I have covered just about everything. The files are up on Thingiverse. Let's check and see if we have the link for that. Yep, here we are in Thingiverse, Dual Action Robot Type 1. And it's always possible. See, I haven't added this video link yet. I'll change this first line saying that the build video is now up. It's always possible that I may have uh, forgotten a file or two in the thing files. Thingiverse is uh, so slow to load, but got the battery holder, got the battery door, body lower front, that's your chest part, all the arm parts, body lower back, that basically is the, the body proper, left knee and cover, head doors, Hopefully that's head and doors. Uh, left and right thigh, mouth, eye, gun, tip plate. I did all those in one because you might want to print them all in silver. Head cap, that's basically the head. All the magnetic clutch parts. Large gear crank axle spacer, so that's your walking stuff. Non-moving leg. Motor frame, that'd be the bottom of the whole robot where everything bolts on. Here's your right knee and cover. We already did the left left leg linkage and cover, right leg linkage and cover, walking clicker arm, walking clicker cam, 
and leg mount, that's that piece that glues to the bottom of the uh, body gearbox that the hip parts mount to. So I think all of the files are there. I think you're good to go. So again, you don't have to use any of the electronics that I did. That was just how I wanted to do it. Uh, another thing that you could drop in there for very little money, and I've got one over here, I'll bring it over to the camera, is up on AliExpress and GearBest and all the places you can get these remote control kits. This particular one also came with a solar panel, but uh, they have a very small receiver. This little teeny green guy right there. And it has the drive in it already and a single channel remote. You can buy these for less than 10 bucks. And it would fit inside the robot and then you could remote control decide whether you're walking or have the gun completely at your own control. And you wouldn't have to fool with the voltage inverter or the H-bridge driver or the 5.5 timer or any of that. Everything you would need would be located right there. You can also, uh, you know, anytime you want to do remote control and you have very, very little space to put anything, you know, these little tabletop racers, most of them are sold these days as Coke can cars and stuff. And 10, 11 bucks, you can buy one of these. But inside this little car, there is a circuit board about the size of your fingernail, which actually can run two motors forward and reverse. But I usually just use the one that's already meant to drive the wheels. And it would drive the motor that's in here, and you could just use this remote for to reverse, and it's a very, very small thing. And the nice thing about these little circuit boards is they'll, they'll run anywhere from one and a half volts. Oh, I've, I've run them on three, no problem. So again, you wouldn't have to fool with the voltage inverter or the h bridge driver or the 555 or anything. You just drop this little board in there, super small, drive everything right off that. You could go with a wired remote like I uh, showed on my video with the dual drive uh, design. So have fun with it. Be sure to post your builds and uh, leave comments. Thanks.